Hey founders, it's good to see you all again. Um, I'm not going to keep the floor for very long, uh, but I'm really, really excited to introduce you to Incidable with Managing Director at Accenture, specialized in sustainability and sustainability services. Uh, going to obviously share a bit with you about his experience in that field, uh, but especially about the, the pain points that a uh, corporate space or so in the field of sustainability. Uh, and perhaps, you know, these gaps are also in the market and opportunity for startups. So, so be very mindful of the nuggets of, of knowledge and experience that uh, the INSA is going to put forward. Um, and that's it for me. And so really massive welcome. Great to have you here at AMCA this morning. And looking forward to, to your keynote. Thank you, Julian. And good morning, everyone. I heard you received a pep talk earlier this morning. I'm not sure why that's necessary, whether that's necessary at all. Um, <laughs> you look pretty pep to me. <laughs> Um, very brief, well actually now the question was to, to give a bit of background to my, myself because there's probably some relevance for um, in, this, in this specific context. So help our clients to, to use sustainability and sustainable development as a lens for improving business performance. So this is really at the intersection of, of making a positive impact on the environment or society and at the same time using that as a lens to improve performance of your business. So this is a business for, for me, for example, to be very clear. Uh, some background, Master's Mechanical Engineering from Delft University. Um, then I started my own internet advertising company in 1999, which uh, didn't make a lot of sense back then, it seemed, uh, to, to, to move into advertising. Please have a seat. With mechanical engineering background, but in a way it did. Um, we did back then what Google kind of does today, matching um, supply and demand of internet advertisements in real time. Um, we, um, we made it to surprisingly far down the road, um, making it through three, uh, three investment rounds and back then. Uh, then at some point, the, um, the bubble bursted. Um, a whole, whole lot of companies went bankrupt. We did it. I sold my shares, joined Accenture, and here I am. Um, 17 years now, or 18 years at this company. Um, so I'll be talking a little bit about a specific concept. It's an economic concept. Uh, called circular economy. I mean, it's not the it's not 100 the same as sustainability, but there's many there's many overlaps, and I think this is a useful uh, concept to think about um, about sustainability and sustainable development as a um, in economic terms. And 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 I'll introduce a couple of frameworks, a couple of examples that hopefully help you understand how you really can use this as a lens for for innovation and for improvement of, of businesses. Whether those are small or large, it actually doesn't really matter. Um, so that's what I'll be talking about. Um, I won't be spending too much time on slides. I believe we have an hour. Um, so, so the basic concept here um, for circular economy, though, is, is really about resources and natural resource consumption. And, and the simple premise is that there's a very strong correlation between, on the one hand, consumption of natural resources um, and on the other hand, economic development. And there's a very simple log plot here. And, and it, I mean, that's today's situation. It gets even worse 
if you didn't realize, it's another two and a half billion um, consumers. And um, this is one of my teams sitting up there. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, two, another two and a half billion uh, people uh, joining uh, joining us on this planet in the next uh, the next couple of years, which is only going to further aggravate this particular issue. Um, now, that's not just an issue for, for the environment and for, for the availability of, of natural resources. It's actually also a, an economic issue. It's an, it's an issue that the global economy is already sensing and experiencing today. And, and a very simple, more from a macroeconomic standpoint, data point, is that if you look at the, the, um, the, 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 the development of GDP over the years, uh, until about the year 2000, for every percent growth in a GDP, um, the typical basket or the price of a typical basket of natural resources uh, would decrease by 0.2%. Right? So, so you, you grow the world's revenues in a way, yeah, and at the same time, you decrease the cost. So that's a good thing okay, for the global macro economy. Now, something changed um, in around the year 2000, where um, for every percent growth of GDP, uh, the cost of that same basket of, uh, of natural resources started to increase by one and a half percent. So for every additional percent GDP, the cost of this average basket of natural resources actually grew faster than the GDP. So that's a bad thing. So the world at large is growing less profitable. That's in essence uh, one of the ramifications, in economic terms at least, of, uh, of, of this natural resources constraint. Um, now, now, where, where does, where, where does, where, where, where do some of those, those, those value or those waste pockets sit, if, if you will? Um, and, and we ran the numbers on this a few years back. Um, this all adds up, by the way, this constraint of, uh, of economic growth and the availability of natural resources, of about four and a half trillion US dollars by the year 2030. So that's a lot of, a lot of money. Um, and there's typically four categories of, of waste in natural resources that we would need to recognize. The one is wasted resources, and those uh, include simple things like, um, like, like resources that are all around us, like wind, sun, solar, um, uh, things that are renewable. Renewable energy is a very simple example. I'll give a case uh, of um, renewable chemicals uh, in that same categories, and it e adds easily up to about one and a half billion do trillion dollars of um, of, of wasted, wasted capacity, if you will. Uh, second one is wasted embedded value. So there's, there, there's over a trillion dollars uh, of, of, of value in, in available um, um, value in, in, in goods that we toss away. Um, and so uh, platforms like, um, like Mark Platz here in the Netherlands or, or eBay, those types of concepts really try to um, try to tap that particular basket of, of value. Wasted capacity may seem a little bit less intuitive, but if you think of it, um, for example, I, I like to use this example of, um, of cars and utilization of cars. So any idea what the utilization is of, of a car over the lifetime of a car in percentages? Anyway. 5%. 5%. Anyone else? 20%. 20%. Three. Okay. So so five, three, that's that's in that's in the right ballpark if you assume that um, that indeed your know, utilization is that there's someone in the car and the car is moving. Right? So but then if you make a couple of further conversions of that five, it is it's actually roughly about five percent then half of that 5% is, is used on average by looking for a parking space. <laughs> so, so then you reduce to 2.5%. Then if you think of the simple fact that the average um, uh, occupancy of a car is about one and a half person or so, where it typically fits uh, about, uh, about five packs, so that's divided by another three, four or so. So before you know it, the actual utilization in, in real utility terms which is in the end moving people from A to B is less than 1%. And that's one of the most expensive, efficient less than 1%. So just, just think of the, the, the incredible uh, 
economic growth that you could actually achieve using the same amount of resources for just cars. So that's a hundredfold, right? If you would be perfectly efficient. And of course, we aren't. But just to give you a bit of an idea of what wasted capacity actually means. And then wasted life cycles, it's simple things like you have a particular piece of uh, equipment, a tool, a product, whatever it is, and it's been tossed away. It's like worth almost a trillion dollars of waste there. Um, what, so what I'll be talking about uh, in, the next, uh, in the next couple of minutes then is, um, is, is five specific business models, and I'll use some examples that we've distilled, distilled from, uh, from over 1,500 case studies that we've been studying and looking into over the past couple of years, a whole bunch of client work and in, in, in tons of senior executives in this specific domain that we've been uh, talking and discussing with an interview. And, and they include, um, and these are important opportunities for, for any company, yeah? large multinationals as much as startups, uh, circular supplies and circular supply chain, recovery and recycling, product life extension, sharing platform, and product as a service. So the simple concept is these are five business models that are generic, that collectively comprise the entire universe of, 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 of things that businesses and enterprises can do to, to actually tap that $4.5 trillion opportunity. Okay? So um, the first one, circular supply chain, um, a very simple example and I'll skip through this rather technical page of loops. Um, so, so this is a um, <laughs> sort of technical pages. This is uh, this is actually a collaboration between Exo Nobel and uh, Photomol. And what they've been doing, if you think about circular supply. Obviously, things like like wind, uh, wind, wind power, solar power, those are intuitively very obvious um, instances of, of, of circular supply that you can think. I mean, it's, it's energy, it's out there, you can use it, it's a resource, it's available, you just, you just need to tap it. Um, what these guys have been doing is they've been harnessing the, the power and the energy of, of, of solar as well. And an existing process called photosynthesis, which most of you will be familiar with, to actually create and generate um, uh, chemical, fourth generation biochemical building blocks. So, and, 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 and obviously the beauty of this is that if you can truly scale this, and if you can make, if you can scale this in a profitable level, you, can, you have an infinite supply of chemical building blocks that just won't stop. So it will make you all of a sudden make you independent of using um, um, what's the word um, uh, uh, fossil fuel as a uh, as an entry for, um, for for the typical chemical building blocks. Um, and and the, the, by the way, there's there's many of examples of uh, of next generation uh, partnerships between established chemical companies that have the uh, the skill of, of demand and need for chemicals and chemical building blocks, and at the same time, more innovative uh, research based or or startup like uh, like companies. Um, so this is really about that was really about this uh, this this business, uh, business model of surplus supplies. The next one is really about recovery and recycling. Um, this is an example of a tire company, a Singaporean tire company um, uh, called Omni, and uh, a shoes manufacturer called Timberland. And the simple model here is that um, if Timberland has a need for a steady, good quality and quantity supplies of rubbers, and at the same time a company like Omni uh, needs to find ways to deal with the... the well, amongst other things, traditional issue, all those tires ending up in landfills and then being burnt and, and all sorts of environmental hazards and issues, these folks have actually sort of joined, um, uh, joined hands and figured out a way to now take these tires after use and turn the, the rubber you know, into the soles of these shoes. There's actually another interesting model that I'll show you uh, from another tires company called Michelin. But this is really about recovery and recycling. And again, I think one of the interesting things is it's not just large multinationals doing these things. It's often a large multinational teaming up with a smaller, more innovative company that uh, that, 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 that partnership is usually very powerful. So, um, 
So, so General Motors, um, uh, basic example there is um, they're dealing with obviously their own manufacturing process. They're also dealing with reverse logistics. What these folks have been doing been very systematic about the uh, generation of waste and the take back of waste. And they've turned that actually into a $1 billion additional revenue stream as well as uh, cost reduction stream. So essentially, if you look at the production process, the manufacturing process of these cars, uh, the parts that they're getting back, uh, they managed to look at this uh, systematically, take back those materials and actually monetize the materials. Um, this one I like particularly, this is Caterpillar, but there's many more examples in the OEMs actually. And what they've been doing, they've, because um, these are huge, huge pieces of equipment. Anyone ever been in a mine? So then, so uh, typically the size of a tile, you want to show for the, the it's, crew? Yeah, it's as tall as it's Exactly. So, so these, these pieces of equipment, they're huge, they're super expensive. Um, and, and, and the headline message here for Caterpillar is they, they turned um, the, uh, I would call, um, uh, um, lifetime, ex uh, lifetime extension model into a, a genuine business model, now generating uh, $4 billion of revenue for them per annum, employing about 4,000 people. And what they're doing is essentially saying, okay, these trucks, they have so many valuable parts and components in there. When it's broken down, actually, there might be, if it's not a DHP bulletin or one of the other huge mining companies, there might be other mining companies that are second tier or third tier and actually would be very interested in buying a truck like this, maybe for um, for 50 or 40% of the price. And then if we're able to take back a truck after a life uh, HP bulletin, if we can uh, beef it up again using some air, and if we can do that, say, at 30% of the cost, we can sell it for 50% of the cost, and at the same time, it is, um, uh, say, 60% uh, less carbon intensive, everybody wins. You still with me? <laughs> and and this, is, this is Caterpillar, but BMW is doing the same thing. They're moving into second-hand cars. If you look at IKEA, for example, if you take an average sofa that's sold by IKEA uh, today, um, and if you really look into the details, they're able to, to extract six times the amount of value from that typical sofa if and when they decide to move into the uh, secondhand sofa sales business. Uh, when they decide to move into the uh, sofa, what's the English word, uh, upholstery business. Basically, it, it's, it doesn't look, it looks a bit scruffy and we'll beef it up and, and we'll resell it again. And it doesn't even include the value that companies like IKEA would then capture uh, by the simple fact that if you go back to IKEA because your sofa is broken or you want to return it or whatever, you are at IKEA again. And IKEA has another opportunity to go and, and, and cross-sell you another lamp or, 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 or a bureau or, I don't know, like Swedish meatballs or whatever <laughs> it is that, that they're trying to sell you. Okay, so, so that's the, um, the product life extension business model. Um, again, many skills. This is huge scale, $4 billion per annum. Sharing platform, uh, all of you will be familiar with um, Airbnb. Right? Fantastic model. If you think about the increase in utilization of the real estate, sort of global real estate asset portfolio, it's logistics companies at DHL called MyWays where they're essentially, instead of constantly expanding uh, their fleet of trucks driving around, delivering packages and all those things, they are now tapping, essentially tapping the crowds of people moving from A to B. And hey, if they happen to have a package that needs to move from, from A to B, and you're, um, you're connected to this network, you can bring a package and rather than a DHL having to put another truck on the road, uh, you can actually make a couple of additional dollars. Uh, and take the package from A to B where you were headed. Anyway, so product as a service, yeah, but there's many more. Obviously. Who's still playing CDs for music? I mean, I don't have to explain. It's, this is it's product as a service. Um, now, 
this is a bit of a tricky thing. It's another product as a service example, and, I, and I'll introduce it if I can manage to, to actually get the thing playing. So uh, this is uh, Michelin. It's another piece of uh, piece of artwork. They're in the tires as well. I gave you the earlier example of Omni that started to partner with, um, uh, with Timberland uh, to take it back. Now these guys actually go one step further, and they said, you know, what if we what if we don't sell tires as a one-off product? but we're going to sell tire kilometers. Right? So we're going to sell you the service of tires. So of course we need to get some technical things uh, sorted, yeah, put a chip in there, and all. But, but those things can be done. So rather than buy the tire and whenever it's worn out, um, you go back to your garage or whatever it is and you get a new set of tires, you actually subscribe to say, for example, 10,000 tire kilometers, 20, whatever it is. And you can agree to service levels and all those things. And it actually, when you, when, you, when you think of it that way, it solves a whole host of problems at one and the same time. That one is that um, uh, in the tire business, but, but frankly, in, in many of these businesses, no one is really interested in tires. Uh, but still, tire companies are spending billions of dollars on advertisements. Well, no one really cares. And why do they do that? Because they want to make sure that whenever... Your tire is worn out, and you need to get some new tires. That you get to go to Michelin again for your next set of tires, even though you don't really care. That's what they're hoping. They spend billions of dollars. Now, obviously, when you have an ongoing relationship, because you've subscribed to tires as a service, all of a sudden, yeah, you don't have to ensure anymore that whenever that tire is worn out for that point in time transaction, this customer returns back to you Michelin because you have an ongoing relationship. Makes a huge difference. More importantly, it puts the onus on Michelin to make damn sure that that tire is actually of top-notch quality. Because all of a sudden, instead of uh, what some of us may sometimes suspect that the, the products are actually by design manufactured to break down at some point so that whenever you need it again, you're going to buy another, get one of those products. Now the onus really is on this company, on Michelin, to make sure that the product is really top notch. Because if they have to take it back more often, because in that, say, 10,000 miles window, they'll incur additional cost. And then the interesting thing, what they started to also see is that actually, um, and this is what the video is all about is that if you really think about some of the customers, and I think that's also one of the takeaways here, if you really think about the need to one of those customers, say for example here, lease companies. Um, initially when Michelin was, was looking at uh, this particular service, they thought, okay, so we're gonna sell tires as a service because it's really great and everyone will love it and it's circular and people love circular and so on. And, and, and obviously no one really cared. Um, because in the end, this was in a B2B business, and there were lead fleet managers that, I mean, in a private life, they cared about the environment, or, but, but in their work, day-to-day -day job, they didn't really. But then, what we figured is, well, hang on, so um, tires might be only 4% of the spent of your typical lease fleet manager. But fuel is actually 14% of the spend of your typical lease fleet manager. So what if we, with this entire proposition, what if we would be able to appeal uh, and, and have some proposition for the 4-0% as opposed to the 4%? What if we would be able to use that same chip to then start to measure acceleration, deceleration you know, of the cars, the trucks, uh, the routes? and start to provide fuel efficiency intel and uh, fuel efficiency services, then all of a sudden, yeah, we would be having a, an appealing and a compelling proposition uh, to uh, these, uh, these fleet managers. Um, so that's what I'll try to show you, if I can get that to work. And I guess then the question is... Um, this is Mr. Best. Yes. He is the director of his own company, The Best Company. 
which has nearly 500 vehicles and five bases in several countries. For many years, Mr. Best has struggled with one major challenge, the fuel consumption of his vehicles. Since this represents 30% of his company, it's not that Mr. Best is short of offers and recommendations. Telematics boxes on new vehicles, eco driver training, reducing speed limits, high tip oils, fuel additives. If he believed all of these promises, the best company trucks would run without fuel. Of course, even though some of these actions give results, managing them all is really complex. And Mr. Best is not a magician. His job is transport, and he's already got lots to do just for that. In the end, there is too much technology, external factors, promises, no time to understand analysis, choosing, testing. What Mr. Best really dreams of is a partner who could take a commitment on their side offering him a durable management of the fuel consumption of his trucks. One day, he meets Suzanne, key account manager at Michelin Solutions. She explains to him the innovative approach of Michelin Solutions, and in particular, the EFI fuel solution. With this, the best company can manage the factors that impact the fuel consumption according to the usage of each truck. Suzanne proposes to Mr. Best a real partnership which is brought to life with key performance indicators, a shared action plan, and once more, Michelin Solutions commits on the resulting reduction in consumption. If the objectives are not met, Michelin Solutions will reimburse all or part of the fees paid. Yes, Mr. Best, you've heard correctly, a real commitment. From now on with Effie Fuel Solutions from Michelin Solutions, Mr. Best manages all the factors for better fuel consumption. Online at My Portal Michelin Solutions, he has access to all the information he needs to manage his team and make the right decisions. Beyond this, every three months, he meets with Suzanne, his key account manager at Michelin Solutions, to look at the business, the actions put in place, and their results. So, so that was an advertisement for Michelin, and uh, I'm not being paid for that, by the way. Um, but I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave it to this, and then I'll take your questions. But the, I guess the essence here really is, um, uh, if you think about sustainable development in business, uh, and again, that's, uh, that's what I make a living of, it's really about the, the finding the overlap between making a positive impact and at the same time improving your business performance. So here's a four and a half trillion dollar uh, economic opportunity, circular economy. They have five business models that probably, if you look at uh, at some of the business plans that that you folks are uh, are, are chasing, there's uh, probably quite a couple of these uh, these business models part and parcel of what you're already doing. Um, think about it. Um, there's many more aspects of sustainable development. I mean, there's there's a societal angle. There's other environmental angles. There's um, concepts like the energy transition, which, by the way, is a lot of overlap with circular economy. I mean, these are all definitions. It doesn't really matter a whole lot. The question really is, okay, if there is this bunch of trends and real imperatives that are staring us in the face today, yeah, what could it mean uh, for my business and my business plan, and how could I turn that into an opportunity? So questions. So practically, how do you and Accenture help a startup if we have a sustainability idea? Yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's a probably a very disappointing answer, but typically we don't really help startups with a, uh, with, with a sustainability idea, um, simply because, well, in the end, um, I think Fortune 2000 are probably our clients. Uh, and uh, I need to make a living and they need to be able to pay my fees and a typical startup wouldn't be able to, even though we tried in the 2000s roughly uh, for a year or so. Uh, jokes aside, um, one of the things I, um, I discussed with Yuri a few weeks back is um, what I do, but it's more on a personal uh, level. I invest a bit in myself as well. Uh, I'm still an LLP in one of the Singapore startup networks. I lived there for nine years. And I've been mentoring startups because I love doing it. But again, that's on a personal note. You know, that's why I'm here. Um, again, not because I expect tons of business uh, from your businesses uh, in the next two or three years, but because I like doing it. And there's many of my colleagues who um, were in it in the exact same way. 
but but if you would have been a two, uh, Fortune 2000 business, <laughs> the way I would have helped you is like, okay, so um, sure, yeah, what is what is the particular what is the particular context and uh, and challenge and opportunity that you're looking at, and uh, and how can we and where is that overlap between on the one hand uh, sustainable development and on the other hand um, business performance, uh, cost takeout, revenue uh, revenue increases, risk reduction, some combination. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, like, and that, and I'll speak from my my own experience as a as an entrepreneur twenty years back, uh, as well as an entrepreneur within Accenture, because I've I've sort of started and, and, and run some ventures within Accenture as well. Um, if if I would, I mean, one piece of advice, again, from my own title would be, is um, you can have a great idea that is too early for the market. Is uh, well, you need a lot of, you need very deep pockets to um, to see that one through. Yeah, I've, I've, I've had it back then, um, with my uh, my internet advertisement marketplace, like again, it's exactly what Google has started doing in 2007, and this was 2000. It was just too early. You know, people didn't get it. We were going straight against uh, a whole series of established stakeholders in, in the marketplace that didn't want to see us be successful because we're actually we're eating their lunch. Uh, so, uh, um, similarly. Um, one of the businesses that uh, that we're in now with Accenture is called um, uh, Building Analytics, where we essentially take out loads of data from large properties like this, and then we apply uh, AI, machine learning, to uh, automatically identify inefficiencies and and uh, like how do you advise a client? How do you help clients take out uh, millions of dollars of, of energy spent, for example? Now, we started this in 2009. Um, I've seen it start to really take off only probably two, three years ago. Now, not because it was a bad idea back then. I mean, it worked back then just like it works today. The big difference was that things like big data and artificial intelligence in 2010, well, no one really got it. I mean, what is that? AI. Whereas today, everyone understands what AI is and, and the power of artificial intelligence and what it can actually do. What comes they do is now. Nothing changed since 2010. We work in same way as 10 years ago. So, what did change for people? What, what, what perspective did change for you? Now yeah. it's all AI should be applied in anything. Well, what has changed? Uh, I mean, I've, I've seen the development on AI specifically. Uh, um, if, okay, so I need to take a couple of shortcuts here. But, but yeah. if you, if you want to believe that, let's assume a large, large, uh, say, uh, 100 floor uh, property. Um, uh, consumes uh, 100 million dollars uh, of, of, of utilities, yeah, and 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 it's technically and practically perfectly feasible to take out uh, 15 to 20 million dollars per annum out of that 100 million dollar utility. So that's a lot of cash goes straight in your image. Um, but if if you've been running a business managing real estate assets for 50 years or 60 or 70 years. And some guy shows up in a suit and tells you that, hey, you know what? I've been looking uh, at your data a bit, and uh, actually we can take out uh, 20 million out of your 100 million spent. Um, and you're essentially telling someone that they're, they're doing a bad job. So and you really need to really understand the power of, of, of something like AI in this particular case. You really need to, need to believe and understand what it is to believe the disruptive force uh, in this particular case. And, and, and if I were to say now, what's the fundamental, the most fundamental difference between eight, nine years ago and today, why now the business does take off and it didn't eight or nine years ago, it's not that people didn't want to save $20 million eight or nine years ago. They did. It's not that people didn't care about the environment eight or nine years ago. They did, as they do today. The big difference in this particular case, eh, but it can be, 
other things in other cases, was that people need to understand and really believe and see the power you know, through all the other things that they're hearing in their day-to-day -day life and in their professional jobs, the power of artificial intelligence, that actually a bunch of AI algorithms can do a lot more than an entire army of engineers sitting in a basement trying to manage uh, a property. So that's the big difference. So I didn't know that eight or nine years ago. Neither did I really knew 10, 20 years ago that I was really pissing off the media agencies and the and the and the advertisement buyers and all those industries that have been taking one another out for karting races and for beers and all those things. And I was basically destroying their way of living. I didn't know that 20 years ago. I, I know now. I know now why things didn't take off quite. But those are all symptoms. Of, of a good idea that was taken to the market too early. So that's one. Uh, in terms of sustainability, like startups doing ideas in terms of sustainable way, and big companies doing uh, some kind of brand awareness about their sustainable. They have money, they have power, they have resources, they can do sustainable business. A startup if you try to be sustainable at start, you might burn a lot of cash. What is what is a good advice? Is it doing a sustainable business or helping these brands become more sustainable? Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe one way of looking and thinking about that is um, is that there's two there's there's typically two categories of, um, of of sustainable business. One is within your own operations, um, and that's just doing more with less. If you manufacture stuff, you yeah, don't generate waste. Yeah, if you need using resources, water, energy, all those things, make sure you're efficient, which is a no regret move, right? Because I mean, you're spending less and that's good regardless. So it's in your own operation. The second is in what you actually do. I mean, what is the service that you provide and what is the product that you provide? And, and especially in that latter category, I mean, there's... There's, there's hosts of startup companies that actually in their very DNA are all about that because that's what they do for a living. They are in the business of, I don't know, say, uh, renewable energy uh, uh, microgrids in, in Africa, for example, and making a profitable uh, living out of that. Or they are in the business of oh, Airbnb. I mean, I love the example. I mean, it's one of the most sustainable companies uh, on the planet, from that, if you really, if you, if you really quantify the impact that that company has made, it's huge. And so, if your question is, what can startups do? I mean, it's it's especially in that latter category. It's in the services that you provide. If you can provide services that cater to um, to sustainability needs of either large corporates or specific customer segments, I mean, they really can make an impact. Especially if you then can team up with one of those uh, those large corporates like uh, Photonol, like Omni, for example. How open are these big companies to help a startup solve yeah. this problem? Yeah, they're very open, usually, uh, because um, I don't think there's a single a single of my clients over the past couple of years that did not um, recognize the issue that they have as a large corporate. Who of you has led, read uh, Exponential Organizations? The booklet? Oh my goodness. <laughs> you should really read it. And I'm terrible at remembering names of writers and authors, but it's Exponential Organization. And the point is... You know, to your question, um, these these large multinationals they have they have loads of cash and they have loads of clients and legacy and all those things, but they're also super. Uh, what's that polite English word? Uh, they're super. Um, they're like mammoths. They're huge. They're um, they're not nimble, um, and they have issues remaining innovative. And what they start to do more and more is. To start the crowd, the, the sort of the entrepreneurial crowd, uh, for what essentially used to be their R and D agenda. Right? So what many of these companies now have, they have like startup, they've, they've 
links with startup networks or they have their own venture, uh, Shell Ventures or Unilever. I mean, they have fancy names for it, but in essence, what it is all about. It is for these businesses to really think about once they've figured out, okay, what are some of those most imminent threats that our business is subject to? So in consumer goods, for example, it's the whole over-the-top businesses that start to add uh, the, one do the Dollar Shave Club for yeah, they, they, the, the product manufacturers that start to sell immediately to the consumers. That's a big issue for Unilever as much as for Procter & Gamble, also for the retailers. So they start to, um, they start to um, basically get, get, get their tentacles into startup networks. So to uh, be able to take minority and later sort of majority stakes in, in these small, small startup companies. So to um, because they can't innovate fast enough. That's a long answer to. So it's an essence question. for a startup to place their exit strategy in somewhere. Yeah, if that's an exit strategy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but maybe it's also just to, to to just have an awareness that there's a there there's often a very symbiotic relationship between a large multinational and small and nimble entrepreneurial startups. Yeah, I mean, there's things that you don't have that they do, of course, like you said yourself, but it's also the other way around. Yeah. Um, do you see any limitations to the circular economy model? Is there, are there any sectors or industries that where you can apply it? Because it seems like it's useful in the asset-heavy uh, industries, like you know, capacity or assets that will be useful. Yeah. Well, you, you, yeah. Well, it, it applies in different places in different ways, obviously. I mean, if you have huge operations, if you're a chemicals company, then obviously getting your act together on, on, in your own operations uh, in itself already has huge opportunities. Yeah? If you spend uh, a couple of billion on, on energy and if you can save uh, 15, 20 percent of that, I mean, that's huge in itself. Um, but it doesn't stop there. Yeah? Um, what I find particularly intriguing is more on the consumer side, where this notion that I mentioned earlier in the Michelin Effie fuel case, um, it's the notion that if you, um, if you can turn a relationship that is typically point in time, where you need to spend billions of dollars on brand marketing investment, so to make sure that that consumer comes back to you whenever the product is worn out or and of use, if you can turn that once-off transactional point in time touch point into an ongoing relationship, I mean, you, you solve so many problems one at the same time. Um, the, the big difficulty there is that typically it's a couple of things. You know? One is if, if, if you're a company, you talk to, say, your typical supply chain uh, person, uh, about something like this and you say, okay, so then we need to reverse uh, logistics. The supply chain person will say, ah, no, that's hassle, it's additional cost and we can't do it, there's no business case, uh, let's kill it. At the same time, if you talk to the marketing person, uh, the marketing person will say, well, hang on, I love it, I, I want this because I'm spending 5 billion, 10 billion, 15 billion on BMI every year just to get those consumers back to me every time with all my advertisements and all those things. If I can just have those folks subscribe to my electronic toothbrush or my whatever it is, then I would love it. So, so those need to go and, uh, and talk together, obviously. But the opportunities in the product as a service realm, they're particularly uh, disruptive, I believe. Other questions? Yeah. Is the, the real idea of sustainability built on that premise that the as-a-service model, which is a subscription, effectively a consumer or customer vote consistently to continue using a product, the pillar that sustainability is uh, as an industry, as an idea, has been growing out of? Because we've all had um, introductions to investor, what they're looking for in a business is predictable revenue. Yeah. Um, subscription uh, as a certain forms of businesses and have that, have that predictable model. Yeah. So has sustainability grown out of 
that idea that it's very easy to predict how a business is going to be successful, therefore it gets investment, therefore it rolls forward, and that sustainability then closes the loop. Yeah. Well, I love uh, I love the idea. I don't think that's necessarily I don't think there's a causal relationship. But what I would expect is that um, for a business model like this, and this product as a service, what you just described, the appetite and the interest of investments, particularly of uh, of, of, of of business and revenue models and the associated cash flows, or something like this, will help. It will definitely help. Because, and I'll abuse your question if you don't mind, maybe, to talk a little bit more about the investor side of things. Eh? Because it's it's hugely important. And and I mentioned a couple of times that uh, there's, well, I won't, show there, I won't say there's no point, but when you're entrepreneurs and and in the end, eh, you, you, you want to find business models and revenue models that are worth your time and, and effort and worth your investors' uh, cash and funds and so on. So you really want to make sure that you are attractive from a returns on investment perspective. And 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 when that's the case, and it's not always the case, eh? um, in, in one of these startup networks in Singapore, uh, there was a whole a whole segment of um, what I call social enterprises. Yeah? So they were still in it for profit, but for less profit, if you will. So they were okay yeah, with, with fewer returns. But then they have actually comparably you know, a lot more difficulties identifying investors willing to invest. Because obviously the yields go down. And, and, and you'll find this everywhere in the economy right now. I mean, if you look at a company like uh, Royal Dutch Shell, yeah, you'll find uh, a whole host of, uh, of investors on the one hand that are quite happy with the typical, what is it, 15% returns over the past hundred years. And then there's a whole host of more activist investors that say, oh, you should go into renewables, you should become a utility company and all those things. Uh, but then at the same time, the 50, the folks that like 15% say, well, hang on, but utilities have been making 5% sort of on average over the past 50 years. I don't want my investment to become a 5% uh, sort of uh, investment. So, so you see those tensions sort of um, pan out uh, in all sorts of places in the economy. And um, so I know that wasn't your question, but I think it's a, it's a valuable point. So if you want to you want to be appealing to your investors, um, I guess the the attractiveness of some something like sustainability, which is a is a is a, um, is a um, transversal issue, right? It's it's everywhere. It's in your product innovation. It's in your op- you want to make sure from a segment and differentiate. That's a good thing. If if you use it to justify lower returns to your investors, I don't think that will fly for many for many investors. Frankly, that's the, the uh, that's the reality. Yeah. So if you look at the coming of the five years, what do you think which markets you see something specific trends in doing different market being created? Yeah. Let's say what we learned here is that you have this and you have a stage of network office paper market. So everything is getting connected. Efficiency is very important, accessibility. But if you look at coming five years, do you see a specific trend going give an example of data exclusion or something else? New market existing. Yeah. Okay, so let me try to summarize your question. So what what is what is a trend that you can uh, you can build a billion dollar business uh, on the back? Of? <laughs> okay. I'll join you. <laughs> um, so I mean they uh, I so figure out and understand what is the real utility? No. Who is my customer really? Um, and what are the, what is the real need and the real utility that that customer is looking for? Yeah? I mean, customer that well, plenty of segments these days that are not looking for a car anymore. There aren't. They're looking for mobility. 
But if you're not looking for a car anymore, but you're looking for mobility, and if you are an OEM, you know, you make cars, then you, you better rethink what business you are in and what, you, what you're trying to do. And, and, and the thing is, you know, at the same time, all of us are getting uh, increasingly spoiled because there's an increasing number of examples of services, most often they're data enabled and technology enabled, that are so incredibly seamless that, that we all want more of those types of services. And if that's the case, then you can you can quickly get into a uh, how you call it a uh, an ongoing sort of a continuously improving uh, wheel of services. So you've identified a you know, very specific customer segment with very specific needs. You started to provide, say, toothbrush as a service rather than sell it, and you toss it away once uh, when the button is worn out or whatever issue I always have with those toothbrushes. Um, and and you start to and, and as you have that sort of base of customers, you start to better understand because it's constantly emitting data and transmitting data. Better understand you know, what the real utilities, what they use it for, what they not use it for. When customers at some point sort of uh, bail out because they don't like it anymore because it was too. But you can kind of understand how that get how that gets better and better and better. And as that gets better and better and better, you you'll start to eliminate ever more waste out of that system almost automatically. So I think there will be huge things happening in that specific area, if I were to say. And in the other areas as well, but, but this one specifically, enabled by technology. Maybe one last question? Yeah. Going back to your experience and being a little ahead of your time, if you had to do all over again, knowing now what you knew, how would you adapt your product market that makes sense? If you were going after those, uh, to do what Google ended yeah. up doing, yeah. how would you have changed your strategy yeah. okay. to, to put yourself in the right time? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm a pretty impatient person. So one answer would have been just just uh, go in hibernation mode, put it on the shelf, wait five years, and, and I, I didn't want to do that. Uh, and I wouldn't advise you doing it. No, there's probably one way... Is and I'll and probably you'll say it a bit disrespectfully, but it was my own business, so I guess I can say it. Is to dumb it down, to dumb down the proposition, because it was too fancy, it was too advanced, it had too many things that, frankly, we thought were fantastic. Because we were a bunch of engineers, and we thought it was great and all that, but it was just too sophisticated, and it provided a whole host of things that no one was actually really looking for. And at the same time, it also did not provide things that actually people did need at that point. So dumb it, so, so one, dumb it down, but actually before that, just better understand who were actually our clients and what, what were the things that they needed. And not just in theory, like something like conceptually, ooh, you, you're a building manager, you manage a building, so there's 100 million of utility bills. So you'd probably be happy if you save 20 million dollar because your title says building manager. In fact, what we had then at some point start to understand that the building manager, I mean, has a role in an organization, but the building manager is in no way incentivized to reduce the utility bill. It's even worse. The guy that had to make the million odd investment in all the kits and equipment to achieve the $20 million savings was a different guy from the guy that would actually reap the savings benefits. In fact, was part of a different organization. So you really need to understand all those things. Now do, didn't do it back then. Yeah. So understand the customers, their needs, and keep it really simple. Okay, I guess that's... Um, Julia? Yeah. <laughs> I've actually become Julia. Oh, you're Julia? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, yeah. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Very good. And enjoy the thing. I don't know what the buzzer was at noon. It said National Alarm. <laughs>